and we'll go ahead and get started. All right, everyone. So, uh, again, this is our key um, speaker. Uh, we have Dr. Dale Lawrence, uh, who is a professor at the uh, Smead Aerospace Engineering Sciences Department at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Uh, his recent interests center, center around design and control of vehicles and sensors for improving and lowering the cost of geophysical measurements, ranging from air deployed micro buoys for ocean surface and subsurface sensing to the data hawk small unmanned aircraft systems for observations in the atmospheric boundary layer and lower troposphere. Um, to the high flights balloon system for characterizing dynamics in the stratosphere. So, with that, I want everyone to help me welcome uh, Dr. Dale Lawrence uh, for the keynote speaker. And with that, I'll pass it over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Let me get my share going here. Okay, hopefully you can see the presentation mode of the screen here. Yep. All right, very good. I'll just go ahead and get started. So I'm going to thanks. Um, first of all, thanks um, James Flodden for inviting me. Um, we've been working on this project for several years and um, having a, a good time, I'll say, um, working out some of the interesting features of um, ballooning in this particular application. Um, so I'm going to talk about our experience um, doing this over the last few years, three years or so, is when our project has been going. <clears throat> um, and it's probably fair to say that um, our experience is not nearly as deep as many of you listening who've been doing this for many years um, for high altitude ballooning. However, I think our experience is a bit different maybe because we have different um, requirements and different application here than is typical. So hopefully this presentation will be of some interest to, to many of you. Um, okay, hopefully you can see my cursor. That will be helpful later when we start pointing to details. Um, so this group is made up of um, three universities, um, Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, ERAU in Florida, um, University of Colorado in, in Colorado, of course, and University of Minnesota are the three main institutions involved. Um, it's a very diverse, um, interesting um, kind of arrangement of people and techniques that don't normally get together. <clears throat> so I want to discuss in a minute why that's the case. Um, so the measurements aspects over here in the upper right, um, CU, ERIU, and Minnesota are involved. Um, the aerothermodynamic modeling that I'll talk about in a second is mostly Graham Candler's group at Minnesota. Um, the atmospheric modeling going on with Dave Fritz, um, who's doing this through um, ERAU. And we also have some optical propagation aspects that are um, carried through by a couple of faculty at CU. So I'm mostly going to be talking about measurements today and um, mostly the um, ballooning aspects of measurements um, is what I'll try to focus on. So let me see if I can explain how these groups are brought together and what we're trying to do. If you look down here in the bottom right, um, this is a um, one of the um, hypersonic vehicle experiments that's going on right now called BOLT. Um, and they're interested to understand how the um, flow over the vehicle <clears throat> at these hypersonic speeds is impacted by disturbances in the atmosphere. So, in particular, turbulence in the atmosphere as it comes over the vehicle has the potential to disrupt the boundary layer on the vehicle. And so, normally, this boundary vehicle, the, the boundary layer on the vehicle, they want it to be laminar. Um, but if it goes turbulent, and this kind of shows some simulations that Graham Candler's done, it can disrupt that boundary layer and cause huge heating effects on the hypersonic vehicle. It also causes potentially um, other aerodynamic effects that would affect the inlet to the engines or the control of the vehicle at hypersonic speeds. So he's done a lot of simulations here that show that that boundary layer is sort of a resonant phenomenon. There are places 
where if you excite it just at the right frequency, you can get that boundary layer to trip and go go lamin or sorry go turbulent uh, more easily than if you excited at other frequencies. And those frequencies are up in the hundreds of kilohertz. It turns out are the um, the resonant frequencies in the hypersonic boundary layer. So if you think about flying through the atmosphere at around Mach 8, that's about 2,000 meters per second. If you consider a one meter um, scale disturbance in the atmosphere and you hit it going at Mach 8, that turns out to be a two kilohertz disturbance that you would be seeing on your vehicle. Um, if you scale it up to 200 kilohertz, like this plot at the right here suggests in that, in that area, that would say that we're sensitive to um, disturbances in the atmosphere that have a scale size of a couple centimeters. Okay, so that's what we're worried about with hypersonic vehicles in the stratosphere. We're worried about disturbances um, in those couple centimeter scale, typically. So that drives us toward wanting up, up at the top here, measuring in situ measurements to be able to recover those kind of scales from the meter scale down to the centimeter, maybe even to the millimeter scale is the um, scale of disturbances we're interested in measuring in the in the stratosphere to relate to the concern about boundary layer tripping on hypersonic vehicles. Now, at the same time, um, those centimeter scale things that we're interested in, those it turns out get created where they come from very large scale disturbances that occur in the atmosphere. And so mountain waves and jet stream shear and other things like that create these very large scale events. So to model those, we have to use very large scale models that might have model scales of you know 10 to the six meters um, and then understand how that how those disturbances cascade down to these smaller scales that might affect these hypersonic vehicles <clears throat> so i'll be talking mostly about um, measurements of turbulence but we're also interested in measuring particles and so um, nathan ferris gave a presentation earlier today talking about particle measurements because particles also have the potential to trip this boundary layer. And so that's why we're also making particle measurements as well. <clears throat> okay, so here's our overall um, sort of set of requirements. We wanna make um, as many measurements as we can above 20 kilometers, go as high as we can above 20 kilometers. We're targeting on the order of 100 observations per year at various sites and some other sites, um, Bolt One in Sweden is another opportunity that we'll be using. Um, we'd like to measure sort of background conditions, but also these um, major forcing events, because those have the potential pr to produce the largest and the most intense turbulence that we might see um, around convective storms, um, mountain waves caused by wind blowing over mountain, mountain ranges, and then jet stream shear. And ultimately we're trying to combine these measurements with these big models to try to really understand how to validate the models, but also to fill in our sparse measurements to get ultimately some sort of predictive capability down here at the bottom. Um, ultimately, we like to have some sort of, you know, um, forecasting ability <clears throat> to forecast turbulence events um, to, so that hypersonic vehicles may, vehicles may want to avoid those, those regions or those times um, where we might predict these these large events. Let me just get my timer going so I can keep track of my time here. Um, so those those are the this is the motivation for for our measurements. Um, so that drives us in in certain directions that we've been um, pursuing for the for the project. Um, with hundreds of measurements per year, those measurements cannot be high cost um, measurements. We have to reduce the cost. So that's one of the main drivers that I'll talk about quite a bit here is the, the cost of doing this. Um, we're also trying to get to very high altitudes, as high as we can above 20 kilometers. We also need to be moving through the air when we make our, our measurements of particles and, and uh, turbulence um, with relatively low speed. So we need to be moving relatively slow so we can get this millimeter or centimeter scale resolution in our measurements as we go. So our strategy is to use weather balloons 
and we'll be measuring on descent <clears throat> because we can't be in the wake of the balloon on the ascent um, because that would disrupt our turbulence measurements. So we're measuring on descent. Um, we're pushing toward a simple single balloon approach where we vent the helium at apogee. So we rise on one balloon, we vent it, and we descend on that same balloon, and also techniques to reduce the ground crew to reduce costs involved there. Um, we're using radio telemetry instead of payload recovery, again, to reduce the cost. So we can make these, you know, 100 measurements a year without having to have a lot of time spent in the payload recovery area. Um, that gives us the push toward expendable payloads, pushing down toward um, the cost class of radio sounds so we can get this large number of launches per year. Um, there are some other issues with the um, velocity and temperature sensing that we do for turbulence that I'm not going to really talk about unless there's some questions maybe later about the details there. Um, but we do have to uh, do a lot of compression to take this high rate measurement that we make and turn that into something we can communicate with radio transmission and again rely on this telemetry of the data rather than recovery of the data. Okay, so here's what our typical profile looks like. Um, again, we're interested in as high as we can go above 20 kilometers here. Um, here's a typical flight where we might have vented. We reach an apogee and then we're measuring our main measurements occur on descent here. And um, below 20 kilometers, we don't really care so much. So usually we cut down to keep the balloon from drifting too far away or to have it, you know, keep it from being a derelict up there. So this kind of shows the case of venting. <clears throat> Another major approach is to use two balloons, um, ascend on one, ascend on two balloons and cut one away and descend on one. Um, so I'll talk about that in a second, but this is a kind of the typical measurement profile where we want to measure here on descent, moving relatively slowly on the order of two meters per second on descent. Okay, so the two balloon approach. Um, Here's um, James Fountain holding a couple balloons. This is the, the approach that um, has been taken at Minnesota and also at ERAU in Florida using two balloons. The middle picture shows um, a two balloon launch from um, some colleagues in Germany at, um, at IAP who do this, who fly this thing they call Alitos. Um, there they use particularly long flight trains. This is about 100 meters. Um, for our use here in high flights, we've been using shorter flight trains, about 10 meter segments each here. Um, but this is typically how it looks when it launches. And one of the balloons here would get cut away at apogee and we would descend on, on the other balloon. Um, one of the things that can sometimes happen is that, you know, the cutaway event is, is a kind of a violent event and the balloons are very stretched and fragile at apogee. <clears throat> So sometimes we've noticed that um, balloons can both can break at, at, when, at cutaway. There have also been other cases where the balloons will um, interact with each other and you'll get a balloon to break prematurely on, on ascent. Um, so it's kind of complicated in the two balloon approach. It also takes more uh, ground people to manage the launch. You have to have people holding balloons and the payload, um, especially in windy conditions, it can take quite a few people to, to do a two balloon launch. Um, Interestingly, the um, ascent is quieter in terms of pendulation with two balloons. Um, we've noticed that typically. And the other interesting question that um, I don't know the answer to, but I'll, I'll leave you with, um, is this picture kind of shows this, this idea that the balloons tend to avoid each other on ascent, <clears throat> which doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Some sort of you know Bernoulli based arguments would suggest they want to come together, but they tend to avoid each other. So um, if anybody has any insights there, that would be interesting to, to discuss. So here's the one balloon approach in the middle panel here. <clears throat> here's what our launch typically looks like. The same person lets go of the balloon, and they also then wait till the unwinder gets to the 10 meter length, and then they let go of the payload. Um, normally we fill in a in a a shed of some kind in the high high wind case, and once again that can be done with one person if you have a, a suitable shed. Our data is returned by telemetry, so here's an example of a telemetry 
antenna set up on the back of a truck that we used earlier, <clears throat> we're now um, going through this automated launch capability um, that makes it, again, much easier and takes less time to, to track the balloons. So let me show you this um, <clears throat> video that from a recent one person launch that we've been doing um, in, in pretty windy conditions. So this is kind of a, a case that was a bit iffy as far as the launch. Um, so keeping the balloon off the ground before launch is one thing. And as you'll see here, when it releases it after the unwinder finishes, the, balloon, the payload almost hits the ground um, on the way up and um, comes kind of close to those towers. Um, it actually scares a bird off one of the towers there as it, went, as it goes by. Um, and then you can see our, our filling shed to the right there and, and our, um, our tracker down here. Um, so in high winds, it's, it's a bit tough to, to do a single person launch, although we, we have done that quite a few times. Um, I'm now working on a senior project um, to do a launching aid that would hold the balloon upwind so the balloon comes overhead um, when you release it. So that may enable us to do high wind launches much more easily. Um, another um, big challenge we have is um, targeting some of these um, particular events like mountain wave events. So down here is a picture of kind of, of most of Colorado. Here's the front range, mountain range here. And we wanna sort of be over the front range high above it when we take our descending measurements. And in order to do that, we have to go way upstream to launch because the mountain wave events only occur with high winds going the same direction through the troposphere into the stratosphere. Um, so we have to arrange for a very large up distance upstream on the order of 300 kilometers upstream. And then tracking the balloon during that time is challenging. So um, here shows a typical 100 kilometer range we might have from a ground station for our telemetry tracking. Um, and so to track it all the way, that would require two or three um, stations along the, along the flight path. So there's some interesting challenges there for tracking in some of these um, applications of, that we're interested in. <clears throat> um, to, to address that, we've recently gone through and, and redesigned our, this is our payload box. It's about the size of a kid's lunchbox. Um, and then our probes stick out of the bottom of it, going down here. And then we have antennas that are collinear and coincident with our, our probe here. And so we're using a, a, a switched dipole array now. Here's the antenna pattern for one of the dipoles. And with the reflector on the box like this, we get about five dB of gain in the direction that matters most when we're um, high and far away. And so this switch dipole arrangement has given us a much better um, link than we had before. We can get out about to about 150 kilometers here typically with um, really good uh, packet reception rates. So getting most of those packets through. So that's helped us extend our range to get, um, you know, to be able to measure with telemetry only and no recovery um, for many of our flights. <clears throat> Here's what the ground station typically looks like. Here's Embry-Riddle's installation on the roof of a building. They actually have two set up here um, using these high gain Yagi antennas and a rotator here that tracks the balloon. So the, the GPS information from the balloon is used to decide what angles to rotate to to keep the antenna pattern on the balloon. These type of antennas have a beam width of about 20 degrees or so. So you really do have to rotate the antenna to keep tracking the balloon. Here's the case we did last summer when we were doing storm chasing. Here's a storm in the background here, um, you know, just on a, on a pickup. This turned out to work pretty well, but it takes a lot of time. It takes a whole day of two people or maybe three people out there to track a, a balloon launch. And so now we're moving toward this more automated um, way of doing it where we have a fixed um, station with um, its own power and a connection with cellular and internet um, to automate the recovery of the data. So we don't have to, to uh, set up and track the balloon by, with people. <clears throat> Um, let me just say here right now, we're, we're, we're doing this and all that data from the remote tracking station, the first prototype is available here. If you're interested, you can um, get on here when we do a launch and you can watch the launch real time and see some of the data streaming down. 
Um, I think I'll, I'll run through this real quickly. Here's, here's a case where we cover most of Colorado. Here's the Colorado Square um, with a handful of stations for front range storm type stuff for mountain wave activity here. Um, and so this takes several stations set up in, in different remote locations. So that's kind of what we're pushing toward uh, in the future. Let me talk about how we how we do our descending measurements. Here's the valve system. <clears throat> um, so a very lightweight tube with a valve with a servo here that opens the valve um, on command. Here's our microprocessor control radio um, link to our gondola so we can tell the valve when to open, when to close. Um, so this has been used on the last 22 flights or so that we've done. Very lightweight, very low cost um, way to vent the balloon. <clears throat> Here's a typical flight showing the, the uh, vertical velocity on the horizontal scale and the altitude on the vertical scale. Um, so you know here it is rising to the troposphere. When it gets above that, it tends to um, quiet down typically to about a five meter per second rise rate. And at 24 kilometers here, typically we'll turn on our vent controller and the vent will open and close here. This is the open, I'm sorry, this is closed and this is open for the valve based on how it, the balloon is working relative to this green target trajectory. So if the balloon is above the target, we open the valve. If it's below the target, we close the valve. And that keeps us kind of tracking that target pretty well up to the desired apogee, in this case, 32 kilometers. <clears throat> And then after that, we typically, after um, Apogee here, we typically leave the valve open for the descent. <clears throat> and so this shows a descent that's about two meters per second. So that's kind of the desired target that we're after. Okay, let me, let me talk about some interesting issues that we've had. So this is a case of 20 different flights plotted all together. They're color coded by Apogee. So the red ones are the highest Apogee. The blue ones are the lowest apogee. We're targeting right in here with the green ones. <clears throat> and this, the triangles here show where we operated the vent for the first time. And what we found is the higher you go, the better the chances you do not come down. You get stuck up there. And so now we understand that what's going on is the balloon canopy stretches too much and there's hysteresis in that stretch. And so it doesn't squeeze enough helium out if it's been stretched, stretched too much with a high apogee. So that limits how high you can really go here and have a descent, you know, coming all the way down, all the way back like you want. Um, so this is an, you know, a, um, <clears throat> a real limitation on how high you can go. Um, another thing I'll talk about briefly later is that um, on the way up, there's a big variation in descent rates for the same fill, same size balloon, same size payload. And so a question arises is, you know, what's causing this huge variation in the ascent rate until we get up here where things settle down. <clears throat> so let me talk about the apogee problem briefly here. So um, it turns out that if the strain is more than about 2.9 in the balloon canopy, that's beyond which you can't squeeze enough helium out and you can't come down. So we've used that to model what can happen here with different size balloons. Here's three different size balloons over a range of payloads. And here's the case that we're, we've been operating at right here. So this gives you a pretty good guidance about how far you can get, what altitude you can get to with um, balloons of various sizes and, and various payloads. So those are real real limitations, right? You cannot really go beyond this um, with the venting strategy. <clears throat> um, I, I hesitate to put equations up, but you know, this is, we're going to talk by engineers for engineers. Um, <clears throat> so here's the the way we get at the, the coefficient of drag here. We're trying to write the coefficient of drag in terms of the Reynolds number to try to characterize that ascent rate that I talked about. Um, so it turns out, you know, if you kind of think through all these things, we can measure all these things and we can use that to calculate coefficient of drag. And down here, we can calculate Reynolds number because we can measure these things. Okay, so let me just do that. <clears throat> Here's the, again, those 12, so those 20 balloon flights that we had before, um, plotting coefficient of drag versus Reynolds number. And so we get this sort of mess um, of plots together. 
But if you look at this closely enough and you look at some of the variations here that are caused by vertical winds and you discount that, you can kind of fit a curve through that with this black curve here. And that gives us a pretty good characterization of how Reynolds number affects the coefficient of drag, which gives us a better way to predict the ascent rate of, of the vehicles. Um, after Apogee right here, after the, all these triangles, um, the curve here becomes less really believable because we don't really quite know how the venting occurs through our valve at, at high altitudes. But the fit down here is, is a pretty good fit. And I'll just leave you with this interesting point that this is different than you typically get if you look up um, people's work on how spheres coefficient of drag depends on Reynolds number. Usually you have something that goes this way down here. And number when you go from laminar to turbulent transition on the sphere. We do not see that sharp transition here at all. And the conjecture that we have right now is that this is because the, the balloon canopy is not rigid. It's very flexible, in fact. And local transitions to turbulence cause that to deflect and um, squish around quite a bit. And that essentially averages over the balloon. And that averaging effect causes this relatively smooth transition um, with Reynolds number. OK, let me finish up here. <clears throat> um, just kind of conclude what we, we've been doing. We've been doing the single balloon vented approach. We're able to reliably reach 33 kilometers and descend for these wake-free measurements. Our costs are about $1,000 per launch, which may seem like a lot um, to some people. But compared to the cost of a large altitude balloon, a NASA you know, super pressure balloon, at about $100,000 per, per launch, um, this gives us you know, 100 launches for the same the same cost. So this this in that context is very low cost. Uh, one person lot set up and launch, no chasing, also reduces the cost quite a bit. The automated ground stations I mentioned are about 5k a piece. So even those aren't that expensive if you need a few to cover a large area. Um, our telemetry works to about 150 kilometers at about 5 kilobits per second downlink rate. And we're starting to really characterize this much better. Um, we know quite a bit now about the apogee and we can predict those well. The drag models, we're starting to get a good handle on. Um, although I'll say the descent remains kind of a challenge. We're, we're not really able to understand the <clears throat> drag, drag model on descent as much as we would like. So I'll, I'll conclude there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so, Dale, we do have a couple <clears throat> questions already, uh, so I'll go ahead and read these off and then let you um, uh, answer them. So, the first question was from Bill Brown. Um, is balloon wake still a problem if you ascend under two meters per second instead of descent at, or instead of descend at two meters per second? Problems, however, are that you go further downrange with longer ascent, but wouldn't require a vent valve or dual balloon cutaway. Um, I don't understand that. How do you descend without cut away? Yeah. Hmm. No, the question is, if you go up slowly enough, does the, does, does the wake problem go away? And then you can make the measurements on ascent, not even bother with descent, if you go up slowly enough. Well, then you're in the wake of the balloon, so that, that's problematic. Okay. So the wake, the wake problem does not go away, even if you go up slowly. That's, that's what he's getting at. Okay, I, I heard wait. So you're saying wake. Wake. Right, sorry, I misunderstood. Yeah, so the wake problem still exists when you go and when you ascend, no matter how slowly you ascend. Okay. Uh, second question was, what are you using for your telemetry hardware? So we're using an SBXX um, radio. So that's a one watt, um, 900 megahertz radio. That's the maximum power you can transmit According to FCC, you know, at 900 megahertz, um, we're using XB3 radios to communicate between the gondola and the valve at the balloon. So that's how we're able to get this large range. We're using the maximum power we can, and also our specialized antenna that I mentioned that gets us just under the EIRP restrictions um, for one watt power transmission. So we're really directing as much power as we can according to those restrictions. Okay. 
Um, another question that we have, um, perhaps I missed this. Uh, how long a line are you using between the balloon and the payload? Right now it's about 10 meters. We wanna get out of the potential flow regime of the balloon when it's up high. Um, you know, when the balloon is up high, it's about three times the diameter that we start with. <clears throat> so about 12 meters in diameter. So, um, sorry, about six meters in diameter. Um, so we're trying to be at least 10 meters below the balloon. Dale, this is a question from James. Um, are there limits to wind? I was actually impressed by that video because I thought the payload was going to strike the ground. And I noticed the person literally, they literally threw it up. They threw it straight up, uh, which was tricky, obviously. But are there wind conditions under which you just can't pull this off? Yeah, I think right now, any higher winds, um, you know, the balloon goes so far you know, away from you that the horizontal angle is low. And so when you let go, you're going to you're going to hit the ground with the payload. Um, that's where we're working on this upwind release mechanism. So we can try to still do single person launches. Um, but, you know, normally now the, the best thing to do in really high winds would be to have a person hold the balloon upwind of the payload and let go that way. Can you tell us a little bit more about this new design? Does it involve putting the balloon upwind? elevated like on a pole or is it really a surface mount yeah it's up on probably something like a tripod um that's up above the ground so the balloon can't hit the ground in the wind and then um a lot's not clear you know i just started the senior project this term so we won't really you know have something that works until next term probably in the spring Yeah, we have poles that we use to get things out of trees, and I've occasionally launched things off the end of poles. So lift the balloon up 20, 30, 40 feet off the ground before letting it go. That's tricky, but um, I, I look forward to hearing the results of the senior design project. Yeah, yeah, I'm interested too to see, see if we can make that work. Um, we do have one other question. Um, uh, will the balloon just keep descending to zero altitude if you keep the venting valve open, assuming you're not above the critical altitude? Yeah, so um, normally we'll cut down at some point just so it doesn't go so far. But if we don't cut down, um, they, they come on down, they descend to the ground. Um, there's an interesting sort of V-shaped characteristic that you know, near, near apogee, it might be three meters per second descent. And at 20 kilometers, it slows down typically to one and a half to two meters per second. And then below 20 kilometers, it tends to speed up a bit. So it'll often hit the ground at three meters per second, something like that. So this is James, you, you might not ever know this because you don't chase your balloons, but when that thing strikes the ground with the balloon still intact, it's likely that taking the weight off of the balloon when the payload hits the ground, means that the balloon never hits the ground and therefore the balloon doesn't pop, or at least not right away. Yeah, you might be dragging the payload around for a while. That's possible, yeah. Yeah, I've, I've seen that happen, have payloads dragged across fields, across highways even, yeah. with the balloon still attached. That's not great, but uh, that's why cutting it is better. That's right, definitely, yeah. I suppose at some point it would often get tangled in something and then, then the wind would blow the balloon down and maybe break it. But... Again, not always. So That's it's correct. Much, it's much better to cut, yeah. Any other questions? I'm not seeing anything yet. Um, oh, I uh, just got another one. Um, thoughts on the use of unwinders to increase the total flight line length? You fly a somewhat similar payload system with Dr. Skinner at UMD. So what's the very first part of the question? Uh, thoughts on the use of unwinders to increase the total flight time length or flight line length, sorry. Yeah, so we do that now. So when we launch the tether between the balloon neck and the payload is about one meter long. So one person can hold both of them. And then when he lets go of the balloon, the unwinder unwinds that to about 10 meters. Um, so we're using an unwinder now. Um, we don't really need to go much longer than that. So 
that's you know our unwinder at 10 meters is fine, but I know in other applications they like to be farther away, and so often people will use unwinders. And so there's things on the mechanical ratchet kind and, and so forth that, that a lot of people have used. I'm not sure. If, I'm not sure if that's what they were really asking. I have a, a follow-up question though. Your unwinder is essentially completely unwound even before you let go, as opposed to like the weather service that uses unwinders. They those unwinders unwind during the ascent. Right. Yeah. So you can potentially do that too. Um, in our case, the way our unwinder works, um, it can kind of get hung up. And so we've had a couple launches where we let go early and we weren't sure that it totally unwound. Um, so that's really just a matter of way, the way our unwinder works. So a different unwinder, you know, might be, um, you know, you might want to try to release it, bef you know, before it's unwound. We were just trying to do it really low cost and really low mass. And so we came up with this particular scheme of unwinding. I remain impressed that you can pull this off with a single person. I don't know anybody, uh, maybe I'm, I'm not that knowledgeable, but I don't know any ballooning team that does single balloon launches, single person balloon launches. Yeah, I don't either. Um, and again, it took quite a bit of playing around. <laughs> To figure out a way to make that work, um, so yeah, it wasn't it wasn't obvious to begin with how to do that. Um, but I think you know, what we have is, is is pretty workable, so we're we're pretty happy with it. Well, the weather service, the weather service does single person launches. That's true, but I'm talking about the academic community, right? For radio right. science, right? Yep. That's that's kind of a whole different deal. Yep. <clears throat> Yeah, we, we share a space that NOAA, that NOAA uses out here, and they're out there once a week launching typically. Um, and their smaller payloads are much like this, where they have one person that does this. Um, and so they have an unwinder, uh, a ratchet mechanical unwinder between their payload and balloon. Um, I don't know exactly what length they typically go to. They're trying to measure on the way up in many of those cases, and so the long line tends to help you stay out of the wake, but not always. Um, so they have, I think they have a, a longer other typically than we have. Bill Brown just mentioned that he's done single balloon launches, but not with such a large balloon as, as you're talking about. What do you think will, what do you think will be the impact of adding the optical particle counters to your device? It'll make it heavier. And I'm just curious, how will that impact how you need to handle things and how high you'll be able to get? Um, yeah, I think now we have an idea of that um, from here. So, <laughs> click too many too fast. Um, so, ooh. hopefully it'll stay here. Um, so, you know, we're, we're here at a half a kilogram for, for my payload. Um, I think, James, your particle counter, is it even 100 grams? Uh, I don't remember. I think it's a bit more than that, actually. But anyway, let's say, say 100 grams. That's fine. Yeah, or even 200. That puts you here. So, you know, again, I don't, I don't think we're going to lose much in, in Apogee that way. Um, unless we go to smaller balloons, then we'd be down here somewhere. Or if you need a bigger battery to support it. Yeah, that might be the bigger weight issue. So maybe we're slightly up here. Up here. So but again, these curves are pretty flat than I really had imagined. Um, um, one other question. Um, so I just I want to make sure we get to that. Um, so the other question that we have is how long do you typically have to keep your vent open before you see a noticeable change in the scent descent rate? On the order of a few dozen seconds, a few minutes, tens of minutes, etc. Yeah, it's tens of minutes. Um, let me go back to this curve here. So we typically start venting at 24 kilometers. And as you can see, these trajectories, many of them don't hardly even look like they slow down until you get up here. 
Um, so we're rising at five meters per second. This is about five kilometers or so. Um, so it's about a thousand seconds before you substantially slow down typically. Okay. And then we have a, another question. Um, this is also from Jake Meyer. Um, why do you think balloons with the vent speed up uh, with this? Sorry, let me start over. Why do you think balloons with the vent speed up after falling below 20 kilometers in altitude? Yeah, that's a good question. That's what we're trying to understand right now. Um, you know, NOAA has put out a couple of papers and they, they suggest some ideas there, but they don't really show why that's really happening. Um, we've done some things like close the valve, um, make sure moisture can't get in on the descent. Um, that doesn't seem to matter. Um, so we're still trying to figure out what's going on with this. Um, I think personally that it's the, it's the shape of the balloon because as the balloon descends here after venting, it starts out spherical, but ends up looking like a teardrop more and more as the air compresses on descent, um, as the helium compresses. So um, I think there might be shape, you know, a drag shape issue that's going on here. Um, but again, we don't really know. So we're, we're looking into that. So Matthew, why don't you share uh, Bill's two comments or one of his most, his final comment, and then maybe we'll thank our speaker. Sure. So, uh, yeah, Bill had uh, had a couple comments. Um, one, he had mentioned that he had done a lot of single balloon launches, uh, but not with a 3,000 gram balloon. Uh, and then the final comment was, uh, thanks for the great explanation on why the balloon valve doesn't work well or at all. If you don't vent early enough, that explains why my valve experiments at higher altitudes didn't work and resulted in 24 plus hour flights floating at 33 kilometers or so. Right. Yep. Um, so yeah, I don't see any other questions. So with that, um, yeah, uh, thank you, Dale, uh, for the presentation. Um, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, and again, we'll um, uh, we have this recorded, so we can we'll let everyone know once we uh, get this posted. So, with okay. that, yes, uh, thank you very much. Okay, my pleasure. All thank right. you. So, Matthew and Jay, do you want to repost in the chat the the links to the the uh, poster rooms because they're in the chat, but they're a long ways back. Yes, I'll put those up, and I know Natalie's already in her room <clears throat> uh, waiting for, for, for visitors. And if I can figure out how to hide my window. Hey, Matt, this is Ron. Yeah, um, I typed a comment, um, not necessarily uh, necessary to respond to uh, in the chat window. I was just wondering if it, uh, if you saw it. I typed a comment uh, during uh, the uh, the panel discussion last time too, and I was just wasn't sure if if those are being seen. I did see it, Ron. Uh, I think okay. what okay. is I, I, I kind of scrolled over it, so I think that's why I missed oh. it. Oh, no, and no worries. I, it was, it, like I mentioned, it was just a gut feeling as to why those balloons might be separating, and it's not unlike the phenomenon we see with the Apollo descent parachutes. But anyway. Okay. I, I didn't see that comment, so um, depending on whether you told it to be attendees or to panelists or to everybody, uh, yeah, no, 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 no. I was finding is that I, I don't know if it's as a result of being an 